Assalamu alaikum, whoever is present here. My name is Fareen Shahid, and I'm serving this platform of Women Power Pakistan as Chief Innovative and Talent Officer. Uh, from now onwards, for the whole month of March, we are starting a new series, which is the Spring STEM Lecture Series 2021, uh, where definitely a lot of scientists and researchers will share their presentations and research with all of you. So it will be a great opportunity and a great experience also for anybody who wants to learn, um, to learn from this platform that what's going on, uh, what's the innovative research from different researchers and scientists from all across Pakistan and international all set up. Uh, today is the first lecture from our series and uh, which will be given by Saida Ume Mehreen. Um, let's me first give an introduction for her. Uh, Saida Ume Mehreen is an electronic material researcher at Nehan Superior Center for the Manufacturing of Electronics Material at Brisbane, Australia. Uh, her research interest includes the lead-free solder alloy development, electronic packaging, metallurgy, and alloy solidification. Uh, she has studied her bachelor's in biomedical sciences, a dual degree from the University of Queensland, Australia. And during her master's degree, she worked with the Center of Advanced Material Processing and Manufacturing to optimizing corrosion measurement methods for magnesium-based alloys. She is presently pursuing her PhD research at the University of Queensland, um, Brisbane, Australia, where she is developing the 10 copper alloys for high temperature solar applications and helping to create more durable electronics for the future. She is also involved in securing experimental grants to observe the dynamic solidification of her developed alloy at the Spring 8 X-ray facility, Japan. She has traveled to Malaysia, USA, and Japan to attend many international conferences, workshops, and also collaborated with industrial um, projects. She is the recipient of the Dean's Commendation Awards for Ex Academic Excellence, Wonder of Science, and Ambassador Award, and also an Australian Postgraduate Award. Um, so we will welcome Saida Ume Mehreen to present her presentation uh, on improving the 10 copper alloys at base. Um, so yeah, uh, Maireen, you can start your presentation. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for that and giving me the opportunity to present my work here today with you all. Okay, so I'll start now. Yeah, please do. Please okay, do. sure. Right, so um, my name is Sia Dalmama Mehreen and I'm currently in my final year of my PhD here at the University of Queensland. So today, I guess the focus of my talk is really about my PhD journey. What have my discoveries been and how that research basically, what is the importance and significance of that research and its implications? So I'm actually doing a PhD at the University of Queensland and that's affiliated with a centre um, named as Nihon Superior Centre for the Manufacture of Electronic Materials. And um, I work with a fantastic supervisory team who have, you know, great, um, you know, experience within the alloy solidification um, area. So I guess the overall, um, you know, one, one word or two word, um, you know, implication of this research is really durable electronics. It's to create more durable electronics and how do we do that? So at the molecular level, you've got solder joints. So I'll be kind of sharing with you all what these solder joints are, how important these solder joints are in the overall, you know, structure and durability of these future generation of green electronics that we're trying to, um, you know, I guess, come up with. So the title of my talk today is Improving Tin Copper Alloys as High Temperature Solders by the Removal of the Cu3SN Phase. So this is our research group um, at the NSCMEM. And I guess primarily um, this centre was established with the purpose, as I've mentioned here, of bringing world-class research capability to the manufacture of electronics materials. So that's primarily to bridge the gap between industry and also academia, but at the same time also to work on an industry-focused or industry-relevant problem. And um, so our team primarily focuses on alloy casting, solidification, 
to create more uh, durable electronics. And what's very um, interesting, I'll share a few photos later on down the track in the slides. Um, we try and translate the research that we are, you know, conducting here to actually, you know, implementing those same alloys in industry, placing those same alloys within electronics and, you know, having a little bit of a pilot plant type setup. So I think it's fantastic that we can bridge that uh, gap between industry and academia. So what is the concept of soldering? We've all probably heard of this um, you know, idea of soldering that is joining um, two metallic components together um, because it's been around since the archaic ages really. But when we look at it, there is so much more to this in terms of actually designing the developed solder. So before we actually get into soldering, what is a solder? Okay, so a solder is basically an alloy. So an alloy is a mixture of metals. So upon application of heat, so here's our heat source, the developed alloy, which is the solder, it melts and as it cools, it creates this bond. Now what we note here is not only does it create a physical connection, but also we get an electrical connection, okay? So on the right here, this is probably more familiar to everyone. This is uh, an electronic circuit board, a printed circuit board called a PCB. And what this is, is basically when you open any electronic device, you will see this sort of circuitry. You see this dense electronic circuitry. So you've got a whole bunch of capacitors, resistors, and between all those, you see these little metallic bumps, okay? So these are the solders. So what do we notice about that in terms of the whole scheme of things? We notice that they are very, very small, but we can appreciate, although they are very small, their importance is vital, okay? So when we think about in terms of how our society is progressing in terms of technological advancements, we are packing a whole bunch of circuitry on there and it's so dense that it needs to withstand large heat loads for these tiny areas. So we can just appreciate how important and critical it is to design durable solders, which need to withstand heat and impact, okay? So base metal plus the solder plus the heat gives you the solder joint. Now, this is another sort of, I guess, a summary slide that succinctly captures the research problem at hand. So the really big issue right now is that electronics are becoming smaller and complex. Now, what does that mean? That means that these electronics need to withstand large heat loads for their small sizes because of the heavy circuit den den uh, density, okay? Now, on the right-hand side here, we've got this issue, which is that the conventional solders were lead-based, okay? Because lead was cheap, it is really a one-size-fits approach. However, lead has been found to be toxic. Now, Basically, all this electronic waste, when we're done with it, it ends up in the landfill. And uh, if, this lead, if these electronic items contain the toxic lead, you can only imagine when it rains, that toxic lead is leached out of this e-waste and can pollute waterways. And you can just imagine how degradative that can be for the environment. So there's been a huge momentum to shift from lead-based solders into lead-free soldering. Okay, now this is a huge challenge because lead was a very much of an all, you know, one size fits all, um, you know, player. But uh, when we're looking at lead free solders, there's so many different potential candidate alloy systems that we can choose from. So this is really an amalgamation of these two um, ideas uh, really form the uh, basis uh, for my research. So this is a phase diagram and some of us might be familiar with this, but I'm just going to do a quick, uh, you know, overview of uh, what this is and how, you know, this is really painted a really important uh, picture uh, for my research. So for those of us who are non, uh, you know, uh, materials engineers, I'm just going to give a quick overview. Imagine this phase diagram to be like, you know, like a recipe. Uh, for, you know, whatever dish you'd like to make. So the dish in this case is our alloy, of course. Um, so basically on the x-axis here, we've got atomic percent uh, and on the here we've got the weight percent. So as we move more towards the right, it becomes, the alloy becomes richer in tin. And as we move towards the left, the alloy becomes richer in copper. And on the y-axis here, we've got temperature. 
So basically, just imagine when you want to make a recipe, you, you know, kind of want, you want to go and look at what quantity of ingredients, what ratio of ingredients you need. Similarly, we use this phase diagram to basically uh, investigate at what composition, what, what phases will essentially form. Okay, so if I, for example, choose the 90% uh, tin or 10% copper line here, then every single intersection that it comes across is a new phase that forms. And essentially, when we make this alloy, we cast it out, it solidifies in the mold, and then we have to slice it, and then we put that under the microscope. Now, what we see are beautiful shapes. Each one of those shapes translates to a different phase that has formed, okay? And that's called the microstructure. So it is a structure at micro level, of course. Now, each one of those phases also translates to the alloy's physical and mechanical properties. So if we have elongated needle shapes, typically they make the alloy very brittle. So for example, what's the implication of that? If we happen to drop an alloy onto the ground that is, has, has those elongated needle-like shapes and structures, that means that alloy will be unable to withstand large loads of impact. So it's not basically because it's got that elongated sort of structure, it's very brittle, okay? If we make sort of um, other shapes that are more equiaxed, and I'll show examples of this later on, that means they're able to absorb the large loads of impact. They act as a sponge essentially, okay? So this is just to give a layman's, just a general perspective of how the structure affects basically its function and its properties, okay? So this is what the phase diagram is, just a general overview. Now this red dot here signifies what is the present composition of the tin copper alloy system that has already been implemented as a commercial solder, okay? It is a lead-free solder that is already established. Now this is excellent composition for low temperature soldering. But I mentioned earlier in my presentation that as we've got technological advancements, we are moving more towards having high temperature soldering. So these solders need to withstand large heat loads, essentially, right? So what would that mean? That would mean that this red dot here would need to move this way, which means that you need to have more copper content. And when we do that, something really interesting happens. So beyond this 7.6 weight percent copper region till about this point here, this blue shaded region, we have something called the peritectic reaction that occurs. And I just want everyone to focus on Cu3SN phase and the Cu6SN5 phase, okay? Because these are the important phases that we encounter in our system. So schematically, that's basically looking like this. We've got the nucleation of Cu3SN directly from the liquid. And then through the peritectic reaction, we have the reaction of both of these components to form this outer region of Cu6SN5. The next step to happen is called peritectic transformation, which is the sequential thickening of the Cu6SN5 layer. Now, what do we notice about this is that the Cu3SN essentially gets completely cornered off from the liquid uh, region, okay? And after this process, what happens is long range bulk diffusion, which is solid diffusion. And we can understandably, you know, perceive that this is a very slow process. That means that the Cu3SN remains in the microstructure. And that's a little bit of an issue. Why? Because Cu3SN is known to be brittle. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a brittle phase within the microstructure that you're designing for these electronic components, the solders, and you can just Im imagine that it's not going to be able to withstand that uh, shock if you drop your phone, for example. It won't work. Okay. So what do we do? Okay. Let's have a look at that. So I started off with uh, tin 10 copper, 90% uh, tin, or also translated to 10% copper as the starting point because that falls within that region. So my strategy really was to figure out how can I go from a microstructure that looks like this with the Cu3SN there, but remember, that's a brittle phase. So we want to absolutely remove this brittle phase and make a microstructure that has only the Cu6SN5, okay? So how I went about doing that is through elemental additions. 
So this is my overall experimental methodology. I thought I'd give an overall uh, flow chart of the different techniques I've used and then dive into each one of them uh, separately. So we start off with our tin, tin, copper, add the element in and what elements that will be, I'll reveal in the upcoming slides. So I've conducted thermal analysis to understand the thermal events, then conducted optical microscopy to better understand the elemental and composition analysis of what those phases actually are. And then last but not least, I think this is the most powerful tool um, that I've come across in my studies, and that is in situ synchrotron studies. So that is basically the uh, in situ real time observation. Okay, and I'll mention why that is the case when I come up to that. So first, let's dive into the thermal cooling curve analysis. Now, this is a very, very simple setup when I show you the image of it, but it's very powerful nevertheless, because it gives us a little bit of a first hand information whether our alloying element addition is actually doing anything okay in terms of removing any phase from the microstructure so this is to recognize the thermal events that typically occur during the alloy solidification process as the phase transformations occur okay so let's have a look at what the setup actually looks like we've got a thermocouple that gets immersed into um, a little uh, scooping cup and this is when you actually have a molten alloy, okay, in the furnace that's all heated up and it's all molten alloy. So it's liquefied metal, okay. This is we're talking about at 500 degrees Celsius, approximately 500 to 600 degrees Celsius. So once it's in that state, we scoop up some alloy and quickly immerse it into a, uh, this uh, with a thermocouple in there. That's connected to a data logger, which actually collects the cooling curve data. So that generates a cooling curve that has temperature versus time, okay? So this is a very simple setup, but I'll just show you why it's excellent for first-hand information. So this is the phase diagram that I showed to everyone in the previous uh, slides. On the right-hand side, this is what the cooling curve for tin, tin, copper looks like. So this is what it actually, the blue curve here is what is generated. Now we can see here, we can see one big peak here and a little deflection here. But what we don't see is this little second peak that correlates here, okay? That is why we do this orange uh, curve here, which is the derivative of the temperature versus time curve, okay? So we see three different peaks. I just want everyone to remember that these three peaks correlate to three different phases that have actually formed in the microstructure. So if we have an absence of any of these peaks after we have alloyed an addition, that means that some phase has gotten suppressed, okay? So I want everyone to remember that point. All right, so just once again, this is the cooling curve, the same image that I showed in the previous slide. I want everyone to concentrate on these two peaks. That is before the peak three. The peak three is called the eutectic nucleation. This here, this peak here will always be there regardless of the alloying addition or not, okay? That's always gonna be there according to the phase diagram. So I want everyone to focus on peak one and peak two, okay? So what we notice here is this red here is what in the previous slide is peak one and peak two. So we've zoomed into that region. So peak one and peak two of the base alloy. What we notice is when we alloy in nickel, we can see only one peak here and this peak has been removed. Now, what does that mean? That means that a phase has been suppressed. So our job is to really find out, that's very promising that a phase has been suppressed, but which phase could it be? So we then implement the macrostructural characterization techniques and also the in situ observation experiments to identify that. So this is just a little bit of a summary slide of the incremental additions of nickel that I um, experimented with. So we can see here 0.02 to 0.04 weight percent nickel. We have the normal three peaks, which is exactly the same for the, as the base alloy, which means all the phases are existing there. But when we go beyond this 0.06 weight percent to one weight percent, we see these two peaks, which means that some phase got suppressed beyond this 0.06 weight percent. So that was very, very promising for me when I first saw that during my studies. So this is just a summary of the different nucleation temperatures that I observe for the different uh, compositions. And this is just to show everyone that no peak, which is the middle peak was observed beyond 0.06 weight percent um, 
And so, yeah, the really the next task was to identify which was the missing phase. So I investigated a whole bunch of different elements and I primarily uh, want to focus on nickel and zinc in this uh, presentation. Okay, so just reminding everyone, we wanted to alloy in an elemental addition to the base tin, tin, copper alloy to remove the Cu fluorescent phase and get a microstructure that looks like this, which is just with the Cu 6SN5 phase. So as I mentioned, the next task for me as a detective, I guess, was to find out which of these phases are there and which is not there. So I conducted elemental and composition analysis using um, SEMBC um, in EDS. So this is uh, what my first results look like that I want to share with you all today. So this is energy uh, dispersive spectroscopy. And we can do point analysis in using this tool, and that shows us uh, the different molar percents of um, the different ratios of our elements. And from that, we can conclude which phase is present. So this is the SN10CU sample on the left-hand side. So we've got this darker shaded Cu3SN phase surrounded by the lighter shaded Cu6SN5 phase in a tin-rich matrix. So this lightest shade is tin-rich matrix, okay? So according to the phase diagram that I showed earlier, this darkest shade forms first, then it gets encapsulated. Remember, I said it gets encapsulated by the peritectic reaction, the Cu6SN5, okay? And then that thickens through the peritectic transformation. And then we end up with this microstructure. Now, what is really interesting is when we add the nickel in, we observe two things. First and foremost, the Cu3SN is completely absent from the microstructure, okay? So this darkest shade here is not here at all in the nickel sample. And the second biggest observation is that uh, the complete change of morphology and shape from needle-like structures into these beautiful floral shapes. And remember what I said in terms of absorbing impact, this was my second point of happiness during my, um, you know, discovery that I thought, oh, fantastic when I saw these structures because they translate, I mean, they hypothetically, they should translate to better performance. So that was very promising when I saw that too. So this is just in a, in a summary. In the tin 10 copper sample, Cu3SN is present. Once we add the nickel in, it's completely removed and we only get Cu6SN5 in the microstructure. Now, that was nickel. What about zinc? I found very promising results with zinc as well. So once again, the Cu3SN is removed from this tin 10 copper and we only get Cu6SN5 in the microstructure. Now, all these results that I have shown um, everyone so far is after solidification has occurred. Now, what if we could observe whilst solidification is actually occurring? That means that whilst the alloy is actually solidifying in that liquefied state, how can we get in there and actually observe how all the components are coming together to make this final alloy? Because just imagine if we can do that, not only can we qualitatively have a look at all of this, but we can also quantify the kinetics of the process. So I did just that and I had the privilege of going to Japan in my first year to this uh, synchrotron facility known as Spring 8. It's in the Hyogo Prefecture and it's, it's uh, about an hour's drive out of uh, Osaka. It's really countryside Japan, but it's very, very nice. So basically what this experiment's all about is observing in situ solidification. So what we have to do is we take the alloy, we slice it, okay, very thin slice, and we put it into um, this machine, the Spring 8 Synchrotron, the X-ray uh, machine. And basically the X-rays pass through that, it melts the sample, and then it has a camera as well that sequentially takes the images as the alloy is cooling down. And then we stitch those images to make a, uh, sort of video, not only can we qualitatively see that, but we can also quantify that. So it looks something like this. This is the image that it kind of uh, gives out. So, so far, basically, we've got a uh, structure that, you know, we've seen this, that's very typical. I've shown you all the microstructures like that, but we will translate it to in situ observation. This is what it looks like. Okay. What is very interesting is we see the Cu3SN surrounded by the Cu6SN5. Hang on a minute, there's something new here. This red outlined 
which is the Cu6SN5 that is directly forming from the liquid. Could we see that in this image? No. So this, lo and behold, this is the beauty of in situ observation. We can identify our phases in situ in real time whilst the alloy is solidifying dynamically. And that is why this is a very powerful tool. So this is basically the video of uh, tin 10 copper that I want to share with you. But before we go there, I just want to quickly give an overview of these reactions. So liquid forming the Cu3SN, so direct nucleation of Cu3SN from the liquid happens first. And then I mentioned to you all that we have a peritectic reaction, which is liquid reacting with the Cu3SN to form this peritectic Cu6SN5 around it. And then we have Cu6SN5 that independently nucleates directly from the melt. So compositionally, I want everyone to remember that this purple phase here, compositionally, it is exactly the same as this phase here. They are both Cu6SN5, but it is the origin that is very important. This purple one here, for the, obviously it's not purple, for the sake of the schematic, it's purple, but this, this shaded, purple shaded uh, Cu6SN5 here, that's called the peritectic Cu6SN5 because it happens through the peritectic reaction. It requires the surface of Cu3SN to grow from. This Cu6SN5 directly nucleates from the melt, okay? So it's morphologically, we can see that it looks very different. So here's the movie for the tin 10 copper sample. So we can clearly see the Cu3SN here, then perpendicular growth of Cu6SN5, peritectic Cu6SN5 happens. And then we see this floral shape of independently nucleating Cu6SN5 directly from the melt. Now in contrast, Let's appreciate what happens when we add the 1% nickel. We see that we get these beautiful floral shapes only, which is only this independently nucleating Cu6SN5 and no needle-like shapes, okay? So the next uh, step really, as I mentioned before, was to quantify. We can go on and we can quantify many different things, many different parameters from this uh, top sort of analytical tool. So this graph here shows that we've got no nickel addition in this line here, and that is showing the Cu3SN growth. So Cu3SN is this phase here, okay? This needle-like phase that was in the middle. So no uh, nickel has that much Cu3SN, and with 0.04 weight percent nickel, we still have the Cu3SN. So you might be wondering, that in this uh, slide here, I mentioned that there's no Cu3SN, we only have this phase. And just, I want everyone to focus that it's 1% nickel, okay? So remember earlier on in the slides, I mentioned that 0.04% nickel still had the Cu3SN, right? So that is the sample that we're talking about in this curve here. So we needed just enough nickel to show the effect of nickel while Cu3SN was still present in the microstructure, okay? What I'm essentially trying to convey is that this amount of nickel wasn't enough to suppress the Cu3SN. That is why we used it in this uh, analysis. So this clearly shows that nickel addition reduces the Cu3SN growth that is excellent for our overall objectives to remove this phase altogether using nickel. On the right hand side, this is a measurement of independently nucleating Cu6SN5, and that is these floral like structures. Now, what's very interesting is that these structures were present whether we add nickel or not. So, that's the first really important observation is that Cu6SN5 can directly nucleate from the melt whether nickel is there or not. Okay, that's the first observation. Second really important observation is that, look at this, the so one weight percent nickel dramatically enhances the rate of formation of this independently nucleating Cu6SN5. And that really helps us paint a fantastic story for the overall mechanism of why this is happening, which we'll touch on in the later slides. Now, I mentioned earlier that apart from nickel, zinc was also quite promising. So once again, here's the video as a reminder of what the SN10CU alloy looked like. On the right-hand side, here is zinc for you. This is without any Cu3SN. So these beautiful shapes that are forming, these are all independently nucleating Cu6SN5, okay? So this is very promising because it very much appears that zinc is also behaving very similarly to nickel itself. 
And once again, we can quantify this. So we can see here, just like nickel, zinc is reducing the Cu3SN. So we can see that this is SN10Cu, and then this is with the addition of zinc. So that's reducing the Cu3SN. And then on the right-hand side, this is the directly nucleating Cu6SN5. So these are the floral-like shapes that form. So we can clearly see that nickel is the most dramatic, okay, followed by zinc. So zinc is 1% uh, zinc is the maximum concentration that we investigated for, and that's the green diamond shape here. And the rest are uh, incremental additions of uh, nickel and zinc. But I just want everyone to focus on the fact that the nickel came out first, followed by the zinc in terms of efficiency of CU3SN removal. So here is our proposed mechanism. Okay, so this is a little bit of a schematic of the phase diagram. So once again, we've got temperature on the y-axis and composition on the x-axis. And here, the blue line here is the liquidus lines for Cu3SN, and the red one is the Cu6SN5, okay? And here, 10 weight percent is what we've investigated. So that's SN10Cu, okay? So what we're essentially proposing is that by adding nickel, let's zoom into this region here, okay? So this is what this figure is here. By adding nickel, what is happening is that this Cu3SN liquidus line is essentially being pushed down, but it's still above this red one, okay, which is for Cu6SN5. The 0.048% will still show Cu3SN. That's what that means. But when we get to 0.06 weight percent, it coincides, okay, and it goes on top of the Cu6SN5 line because that is the threshold limit. And then we add in one weight percent nickel and we can clearly see that falls below. And now that is very much easing the formation of direct nucleation of only this phase directly from the melt, okay? And these temperatures here correlate to the thermal analysis uh, temperatures that I mentioned to you in the first couple of slides, okay? So this, all of this story really nicely fits in uh, and how it correlates uh, to the temperatures as well. If anyone is interested in this research till uh, now, what I've presented, then you can um, visit this uh, QR code. Uh, it's a publication in the Journal of Alloys and Compounds, so you can read about it uh, there. Now, this is a very much of a fresh result uh, because this is actually very, very recent. Um, so it's very much of a preliminary investigation, but uh, you know, I was quite excited about this. And, uh, you know, I was discussing with my supervisor about the topic to present today, and he was actually quite excited for me to share this with you all here today as well, because it's very, very new. So we found that nickel and zinc in the previous uh, slides uh, was removing the Cu3SN. We've recently found that cobalt also does the exact same thing, okay? So this is the elongated needle-like shapes of the SN10Cu. When we add the cobalt in there, that completely removes that face and we get only these floral-like shapes of directly nucleating Cu6SN5. Once again, this is very, very new. So this is a very preliminary result. But we've employed this technique called EBSD, so electron backscatter diffraction. And essentially what this technique is all about is really understanding the crystalline structure of our material. So by investigating the crystal structure, we can see if there's any mismatch, misorientation relationships that we can get from these phases. And that can also be an added uh, analytical tool that can help us explain, better explain how these elements are causing um, this phenomenon. So really, our next step was to investigate the distribution of these alloying elements within the tin tin copper system. So we can clearly see that the nickel, the zinc and the cobalt, the nickel, all these, all these three, we can clearly see that the alloying element was found in this pink phase. Okay, so what this slide basically is, I want everyone to remember that I've conducted point analysis of the phases, like how I showed in the SEM, okay, images previously. And what that's basically done is that's shown us where these elements are situated in the phases, okay? So this pink phase correlates to the Cu6SN5. So we can clearly see a trend that those phases that negate Cu3SN out of the microstructure are all located in that Cu6SN5 region. 
So perhaps we can then translate this into a theory that, you know, we are having more diffusional kinetics that's promoting the growth of Cu6s and 5 because we've got this um, uh, element that's embedded itself into this phase rather than the Cu3SN. And thereby, Cu6s and 5 formation is enhanced and Cu3SN formation is completely slowed down. And once again, this is a very new publication just out in January 2021. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can uh, scan this uh, link here as well. So what is the meaning of all of this? We can essentially translate the effectiveness of these alloying elements, okay, in terms of removing the CU3SN phase. So on the y-axis, we've got the concentration. On the x-axis, we've got the elements zinc, nickel, and cobalt, okay? These are the promising candidates that removed the phase CU3SN. The green dot signifies that we successfully removed the CU3SN from the microstructure. And the red dot signifies that CU3SN was still present, which means that that alloying addition wasn't alloyed in a large enough amount that that phase was removed. So it's still low. We can see that cobalt is the most effective because at the lowest of its concentration, it has successfully removed that CU3SN from the microstructure, followed by nickel, followed by zinc. So we can essentially uh, you know, group and uh, order the efficiency like this, okay? So that brings me to the conclusion of my uh, presentation. So we've seen that nickel, zinc and cobalt all affect the microstructure of the tin 10 copper alloy by removing the C3SN phase. We've quite simply translated all of this in terms of its effectiveness. Um, and this is very useful for industry. They can translate this to, you know, using seeing which element is the most useful. And why do we want to do all of this? Well, we want to do this in terms of removing the CU3SN phase because having these brittle phases uh, may not necessarily be uh, favourable for the alloys if we want to design them for more durable electronics. We want a structure that can withstand that um, heat loads and impact. So in terms of tolerating the heat, we're adding the more of that copper in there. And in terms of uh, tolerating the impact, we're completely changing the morphology. So that is definitely promising. Now, before I end off, I just want to kind of uh, give a little bit of a human touch to this presentation. So up till now, I've given the technicalities of my PhD research, but I just want to end off with this slide because uh, PhD for me has been an incredible journey. I've met wonderful people. I've networked with brilliant minds. Um, and, you know, there's nothing like excellent collaboration. You get to learn from your peers um, in academia and in industry. And I really thrive on that. I really appreciate the mentorship that people have given me. And also, I've gotten the opportunity to travel to many different countries. And I just wanted to kind of share that in this um, picturesque slide. So I went to Malaysia to go to a conference. Uh, we were, attended a workshop. And um, this is actually the CEO of uh, Nihon Superior in Japan. And uh, Nihon Superior, I haven't mentioned this very interesting point in the slide because I thought I'd save the best to last. And that is that the solders that are actually in the electronics today, many of them are actually uh, SN100C, which is uh, from Nihon Superior. So um, this is the CEO of that company. We've got that joint collaboration with them. So it was really nice to um, meet with him and, uh, you know, you know, get some sort of guidance in terms of what industry actually requires. And so to mix that, the requirement of industry with uh, research has been a fantastic, uh, you know, opportunity for me. I also went to Japan and uh, we went to workshops in Malaysia as well. And uh, just, just before COVID hit, actually, we went to San Diego conference in the USA. Uh, it's called the TMS conference. So that was a fantastic privilege because that's the biggest conference in our field. So as a PhD student, uh, I feel very privileged that, um, you know, I've been given an opportunity uh, to attend all these places and meet wonderful people. And of course, this research wouldn't be possible without um, many different uh, governing bodies such as UQ, Nihon Superior, Microscopy Australia, Spring 8 in Japan, the Australian Government for, um, you know, uh, the Australian Award Scheme. And also we've got fantastic collaborations with um, Kyoto University in Japan. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my, you know, audience for giving me the time and listening to me. So thank you very much. And also to We Empower um, for giving me the opportunity to come here and share my research with you all today. Thank you once again. Oh, well, thank you, Marine, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, it's really interesting to know, and thank you 
and it's an honor that you uh, spare your time and give us some of your time to this platform of Women Power. And to all the viewers who will listen and who are listening, uh, that will get some insight from your wonderful research. Uh, before we can go further, uh, is there anybody who would like to ask any question to Marilyn? That will be highly appreciated if you just ask anything about her research or the presentation. I'm, a, I'm an engineer by profession. So for me, it's a bit difficult to get into those phases and to um, the materialized things. But uh, what I can ask is that how you physically implement whatever you researched, like what will be the application of all of this in real life? Like how we can benefit? Is there any benefit we can get from all these characterization and all these materials? Um, how can we get the benefit from the real world, in real world? Sure, that's a really good question. So um, I think one thing that I've appreciated in this journey of a PhD is we are only a small player in the big scheme of things, right? So when I say durable electronics, it is a massive umbrella and little stems of niches come off that, okay? So um, although our contributions as researchers, um, you know, we might get little publications here and there, our impact at that micro level um, seems, you know, like we've made a bit of a discovery. But in the whole scheme of things, I think it's a collaboration with all the different um, other results that other researchers get to make the final product, okay? So I think when, uh, when I, I can speak about, um, you know, my research specifically, and so in my research, I guess the main problem definition was, hey, go off and create an, an alloy that is lead free. So it has to be environmentally friendly. So no toxicity there at all. And it needs to be able to withstand large loads of heat. So it needs to, you know, be, you know, you know, physically, you know, put together really and um, able to uh, maintain its structure and its shape. It needs to also withstand large loads of impact. So those three things, I guess, really defined, um, you know, how I'm supposed to be designing this alloy. So I went off and I researched different potential alloy candidates. And I guess the other really big thing is that you need to get inspiration from a whole bunch of different fields, okay? And that's where the innovation really comes in. And then you have all your ingredients of what you want to kind of toy with, essentially. The next step really is to see what are the different characterization tools that I have got to characterize the end result, okay? Then we, we've done that. Um, I've shown you that through the um, presentation. The next step really is what is the real world implication of all of this, okay? So obviously a PhD is a limited time and I'm still as a, as a PhD student. So in terms of my next step from here will be to translate this developed solder onto a substrate. So in the first couple of slides, I showed everyone the PCB, the green printed circuit board. So my job will be to put this developed solder onto this PCB and evaluate its performance, okay? Then we'll also take it uh, to Nihon Superior in Japan, that industrial, um, you know, that, that factory there and see the real life implication. We'll conduct the tests and everything like that. But the preliminary investigation that is, at the micro level, what is the structure looking like? That is everything that dictates whether the futuristic possibility or potential is gonna be there in the first place. So what I have done has painted the platform for that um, to occur. So the preliminary results that I've shared with everyone today, that's definitely promising. So we hope to kind of implement that in terms of an industrial solution. Yeah, Does that thank answer you. the question? Yes, thank you so much for this, uh, the whole overview, because for a layman, it's a bit difficult to understand about what's going on in the material side and everything. Oh. Um, so is there anybody who would like to ask any question to Ms. Marine? Uh, can I have us? Can, can I ask a small question, please? Yes, please do. Yeah. Hi, Marine. Excellent talk. Uh, it was really engaging, and thank you very much for that. So, uh, my my question is, in fact, like I should have asked you, you know, in person as well. So, uh, 
do you see like a simulation uh, could play a part you know you talk about uh, like uh, uh, a futuristic approach uh, like mm -hmm. to predict something uh, if uh, one can perform some uh, like highly accurate simulations and then come up with you know some specific ratio of you know alloying materials Certainly. and then provide you with that information and then you can go to lab and do that so how do you think about that sure yeah. sure yeah. absolutely i think i think that's a very important point that you have um you know mentioned there that is very important why because you know, obviously modeling and simulations, regardless of the area, there are wonderful, it's a wonderful field because before you waste your energy in the lab, you can essentially model it and see whether it's any use to, you know, get in and actually practically do something. So first, let me make that point that modeling and simulation, I think is, it's a field that absolutely should be appreciated regardless of the area. Now, more specifically towards, um, you know, this research area, I mentioned that these different alloying elements, the trend is that they go and they're found in the CU 6 SM5 areas. Now, what's further really, really interesting is that we have these spaces called the interstitial spaces, right? So within that, it can go and embed itself into copper or it can go and embed itself into tin. So what's really interesting is, hang on a minute, can we find out before we actually, you know, do expensive TEM and everything like that, can we find out using modeling and simulation where these um, alloying additions can embed themselves into which part of the matrix really. And that would be very powerful, um, you know, to basically do the uh, subsequent uh, experiments. I think that would be really, really fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there more questions for him? Um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation. So to marks the Women International Day also, so I wish you a happy Women's Day. And I would like to use this opportunity uh, to say that we know that 8th March is Women's Day. And it's the day for praising women who work really, really hard every day to accomplish their individual and professional goals. Um, so we need to reshape our own perspective of our own views, how we think. Um, so thank you so much. Please keep on inspiring other women. Uh, keep on doing research. Um, your efforts are really, really highly appreciated. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, today is the end of the first lecture. Uh, we will definitely have a lot more lectures in the coming days. Tomorrow you will, inshallah, uh, will listen to another lecture by Dr. Taiba. So please do listen to that and do follow us over Facebook also. Thank you, everybody. Um, Allah Hafiz. Take care.